We good? Anyone glad to be alive in the house of God? All right, I just, man, I just think God wants to bust open some things in this place. He wants to, he wants to tear off some limitations, but I just, I know he's already moving, but I just believe that he wants, he wants to take us into a place that maybe some of us have never been before. And it's, it's about posture, but sometimes our posture's gotta start with our praise. Our praise has gotta set the expect, gotta set the foundation for what God wants to do. I don't know if there's anyone thankful in this place for who God is, for what He's done in your life, but I'm just wondering if you would just take a moment before we even get to this Word today, just to lift up some praise and let our God know that He is good, that you understand that He's good. He's good, He's good, He's good. Come on, somebody just Take a moment and lift up some praise. Lift up some praise. Lift up some praise. Come on, take a moment and lift up some praise. Here in this room, watching online, lift up your praise. Cause He's worthy, He's worthy, He's worthy. Yay! Then sings my soul. Come on. today that we would not come in this moment passively that we would be postured to meet with you to receive from you because you are a good God you're a good God you're a good God oh he's a good God Before you grab your seat, I want to read to you. This is not really part of my text, but this is the pretext to the text. I want to read to you from Ephesians 3, verse 20 and 21 from the Amplified. So forgive me if I get a little loud because it's the Amplified. And why does nobody laugh at that joke? Preacher's jokes are the worst jokes. And it's kind of like there's like dad jokes and then there's like preacher dad jokes. Sit down. Ephesians 3, 20, 21, from the Amplified. Now to Him who is able, and then it says in parentheses, to carry out His purpose. It's important that we understand it's not our purpose, our dreams, our desire, His purpose. And do super abundantly more than all that we dare ask or think. And then in parentheses again, in infinitely beyond our greatest prayers, hopes or dreams. Just ponder on that for a moment. What's the greatest thing you've ever thought about, hoped for, dreamt of? God is super abundantly far above and beyond that according to His power that is work within us. To Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Our God is a God who defies expectation. He defies expectation. He is capable of more than we dare dream or ask or imagine. God's been speaking to me these last few weeks about this word expectation. I believe faith is about bringing my expectation in line with who God is, not who I perceive God to be. Not who other people have told me God is. Not what Instagram tells me about who God, not what the world tells me about who God is, but what His Word tells me about who God is. See, I gotta bring my perception in line with the promise. 
that's how I bring my faith into the reality of expectation. I want to preach to you from the thought today, the agitation of expectation. The agitation of expectation. Would you turn to your neighbor and look them in the eye and say, the agitation of expectation. If you feel like you're rejected because there was nobody sitting and standing next to you and didn't just turn to your other neighbor and say the agitation of expectation. Come on, high five somebody and grab your seat. <clears throat> you know, our, uh, our expectation is often determined by our experience. Our expectation is often determined by our experience. If you don't know what I mean, I just want to give you a little example of something that most adults here in the room would understand. Let's talk about the DMV. <laughs> most, of, most of us laugh because we've had an experience at the DMV that has caused us to walk in some level of expectation. And sometimes ex expectation can be a good thing. Sometimes we have an expectation of the negative side of things. If you've ever been to the DMV before, I don't want to throw the DMV under the bus, but I'm sure that many of us in the room have not always had the best experience at the DMV. And so at least, you know, for me, I have an expectation. I, when, I, when I know that I've got to go to the DMV, because of my past experience, I have an expectation of what I'm going to get. There's a particular, uh, let's call it a uh, restaurant, but really quasi fast food chain that we like to, you know, partake of here in, in, uh, in Nashville. And uh, I won't call it out because there's different locations around our city, but there was one particular location that was, the management was not the best, it was not the best managed place that I've ever been to, if I can put it like that. And so when we would go into that place, it, it was, it was, Dirty, it was not cleaned, it was, lines were out the door, they never had the food that you wanted, and the service was poor. And so you know what? I developed an expectation because of my bad experience. And so, once, a, in the last few months, we, we actually visited this place again, and, and I walked in with the same expectation that I'd had in the past because of my past experience. But you know what I discovered? There was new management. And all of a sudden, my expectation was exceeded because no longer was this place dirty, no longer were the lines out, they had the food and they had organization. And it changed my expectation because I had a different experience. See, some of us here today, we're stuck in an old experience. Now I believe God wants you to lift your expectation because God can never be outdone. I believe one of the greatest issues in the church is not whether or not God can do miraculous things, but whether or not His people will believe. In a Christian culture that's oftentimes more comfortable than it is courageous, God, I believe, wants to stir His people not to exist, but to expect. I want you to ask yourself today, am I existing or am I expecting? Am I showing up or am I coming ready? Am I here in body or am I really here present in spirit? I want to expect that God is going to move. See, many people live with the mindset, if there's no expectation, then there's no disappointment. And that might be true, but there's no reward if there's no expectation. There's no breakthrough if there's no expectation. There's no miracles if there's no expectation. There's no new levels if there's no expectation. I don't wanna just exist in my Christianity and think that that's okay. We are called to be people who have an expectation on God. I'll never forget years ago, I was talking with a pastor and he just, he couldn't believe that we had 
talked about the miraculous, about believing for miracles, about believing God that there was actually more than what we'd experienced because he, he said, you know, we haven't preached on miracles in maybe 20 years. And I said, why not? And he said, well, we just didn't want people to get disappointed. That if, they, if we taught on it and then they prayed for it and they didn't get the miracle, then they would be disappointed. But I wanna encourage you today, friends, if it's in the Word of God, then we can expect that that's what God wants to do. Now, here's the thing. We don't put our expectation in an outcome, but we allow our expectation to change our outlook. God's not always gonna do what we pray and believe for on our time frame, but He will do it according to His power and His purpose that is at work within our lives on His timeline. And so we gotta live from a different vantage point, a different expectation. I wanna read to you from Luke chapter eight, starting at verse 40. It says, Now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed Him, for they were all expecting Him. There was an expectation in the crowd. They didn't know what to expect from Jesus, but they knew that there was some, something worth expecting from Him. And then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with Him to come to His house because His only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on His way, the crowds almost crushed Him and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. No one could heal her. She came up behind Him and touched the edge of His cloak and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, no, someone touched me. I know the power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at His feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched Him and how she had been instantly healed. Then He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead. He said, don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe and she will be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not allow anyone to go in with, it, with him except Peter, John and James and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She is not dead, but asleep. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, my child, get up. Her spirit returned and at once she stood up and then Jesus told them to go have something to eat. Jesus loves food. <laughs> Amen. It's the end of my message. Get it. I, just, I, I wanna dig into this text a little bit with us today. Some of you are already thinking about lunch. Just take authority over the flesh right now. But listen, this man Jairus, he, he's a synagogue leader He's a man of God. I'm sure someone who believed that he is a good person, in many ways I'm sure that he was. And here he is, his only daughter, a 12 year old girl is dying and he comes to Jesus with an expectation. And you know, sometimes when I, when I read the Word of God, I, I try and put myself in the position of some of these people. It's easy to read these stories and kind of disconnect, but have you ever put yourself in that position? And I, I, wanna, I wanna take a, a little bit of a, a liberty here. This is not theologically incorrect. This, I believe it's just gonna you know, just give you a little bit of different context here, but I wonder if I were Jairus, a godly man, someone who's a leader in the house of God, because I know in my own life, I've come with some expectation of Jesus sometimes. And maybe there's just been a small part of me that's thought, well, Jesus, haven't you seen all the things I've done for, for you? I need you to do something for me. I wonder if this man thought that because he was a good man, that he deserved something good from Jesus. I'm sure no one else in the room is like, 
me this morning. I'm sure nobody else has ever thought, God, I deserve this, at least a little bit of it. Nobody else is entitled in the room except for me. Just turn to your neighbour right now. I'm just kidding. Don't turn to your neighbour. I wonder how many times we think and we pray prayers and there's just the smallest part of us that, that believes because we've done something good for God or because we've been a good person or, oh God, but I, didn't you see when I did that? Or God, didn't you see when I gave in that offering and it really cost me? So I'm, I'm, I feel some level of entitlement. But here's the thing, friends. If Jesus' goodness in your life is dependent on you being good, at some point your goodness is gonna run out. And I, I don't know about you, but I kind of thank God that His goodness is not dependent on my goodness. Because my goodness has got an expiration date. My goodness has got a limit. My goodness is going to run out along the way. My goodness is going to give in to frustration. My goodness is at times going to give in to my flesh. My goodness at times is going to give in to my, 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 my angst in the moment. But I thank God that His goodness is not dependent on my goodness. And I want to tell you this today, friends, because some of you, you've been hoping and believing that God owes you something in the middle of the situation that you're in. And so rather than being expectant, you're entitled. But I'm telling you, God is doing you a favour. He's doing you a favour because there's going to be a, a moment where your goodness runs out and all of a sudden you're going to doubt whether you're worthy of God's goodness in your life or God's miraculous power in your life. But I thank God that His goodness is not dependent on my goodness. Anyone thankful in this room today that on your worst days, God's goodness doesn't run out on your worst worst days, God's kindness doesn't run out. On your worst days, God's mercy doesn't run out. His goodness is not dependent on you being good. His goodness is going to bring the good out of you. But Jesus doesn't owe you. This is not about entitlement. This is about expectation. I want you to watch this play out with Jairus. Just put yourself in Jairus' shoes for a minute. He's, he's gone to see Jesus. He's got Jesus' attention. And now he's on his way with Jesus to go get the miracle that he needs. Now this is a legitimate miracle. Sometimes I think we pray for things and we're like, well, I don't know if I should really pray for this because, you know, is it a real... This is a real need. You know, like this is... This, on the level of need, this is like a real need. You know, you got some needs in your life and then you got some needs in your life. He's got a real need. He's got Jesus' attention. He's got expectation in his heart that Jesus can do something about it. And Jesus says, let's go. And so they go on the journey. I don't really know how Jesus walked. I don't think it's like this. I kind of feel like this is how Pastor Paul walks sometimes when he's on the stage. But I'm not sure that that's how Jesus walked. I don't know how Jesus walked. But they're on their way to go get the miracle. Now, I don't know if you've ever found yourself in a moment where you feel like you've got Jesus' attention. He understands your need and you understand that He understands your need. And you're like, all right, we're gonna be good. And then you get on your journey and it seems like Jesus gets distracted. <laughs> it's like, wait, wait, hey, Jesus, what? Why did you stop for that person? Like they got a need, but I got a need. Like their, their need's important, but my need's real important. I know somebody else needs a breakthrough in their marriage, but I really need a breakthrough in my marriage. I know somebody else needs a breakthrough in their finances, but I, Jesus, you know how bad this is right now. And Jesus seemingly stops on the journey to Jairus' miracle. I wonder how many of us would have got offended by Jesus in that moment. But Jesus, how could you? Jesus, I thought we were going to get my miracle. Why are you stopping for that person's Miracle, I wonder how many of us get offended because on the way to our miracle, we've seen Jesus do some other people's miracles, but we haven't got our miracle yet. And so whether we want to admit it or not, we've set up camp in a little bit of this, this, this offence. 
Some of you right now, it's time to check your heart because there were some things that you were praying for and you didn't see them when you were hoping to see them. And so you got just this little bit of offense and what you did is lower your expectation down to your perceived reality in the moment through offense. But can I tell you this today, friends? Your offense with Jesus is holding you back from your breakthrough from Jesus. That's a word for somebody. That's a word. Your offense is holding you back from your breakthrough. When Alex and I were first married, some of you know our story. We've been married 25 years and they diagnosed Alex with a condition that meant that she couldn't have kids. And I remember, you know, we, 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 we saw it for what it was. We realized that this was the enemy coming to stand in the way of God's promise because before we were even married, she had several prophetic words one of them very clearly talking about having a daughter and a son. And so in that moment when the enemy came with what seemed like a truth or a fact on paper, we had to hold on to the truth of the Word of God, the promise of God. See, sometimes we get facts and we live by the facts instead of living by the truth. And it's not that we ignore the facts, we just gotta bring the facts into the context of the truth of the Word of God. See, we had a truth that overruled the facts of the moment. We had a truth that said there's gonna be a daughter and a son. So even when the facts came and said we couldn't have kids, we knew we could appeal to God in the moment. But see, we, we got a promise, and then we went on the journey of believing God for that miracle. But the thing was along the way, as we were believing for a miracle, other people who didn't even need a miracle were having kids all around us. Now we had a decision to make in that moment. Are we gonna get offended that somebody else, they don't even, I mean, listen, every child is a miracle. They didn't need, they didn't have a need like we had a need, but they still got their miracle. Are we gonna live in the place of offense until we get the breakthrough? Or are we gonna posture our hearts and say, you know what, God, if you're gonna bring a miracle to someone else, then I'm gonna take that as seed. I'm gonna take that as fuel. I'm gonna take that as a sign that if you could do it for somebody else, then you can do it for me. So my wife, you know what we would do? Every time somebody had a baby shower, my wife would show up with gifts and we would shower that person with love and honor the miracle that God was doing. Even on the hard days when we were still waiting on that journey. But we made a decision. We would not allow offence to get in the way of the breakthrough that we knew God had for us. Even when it didn't always feel good. See, faith, sometimes we get excited on the good days. I got faith in this. We get excited in an atmosphere like this. I got faith in this. But then there are days where it don't feel so good. And that's where faith really kicks in. That's where the enemy comes with the whisper, God, God's not gonna do it for you. He never said that. You're, you're making this stuff up. You gotta hang on, hang on to the truth of the Word of God. And we hung on and you know what? A couple years later, God gave us a miracle. And what do we have now? We have a daughter and a son, just like God promised. Now there was a contending for it. But what did that do in our lives? Not only did we get a miracle in our own lives? God used that situation in order to plant seeds of faith in other people's lives. Because even though while we were waiting on a miracle and we had a big need and it seemed like others' need were not so big, but God was still answering it. We had some other people around us who had legitimately big needs. Miracles that they needed. They'd been believing God for children and all of a sudden, after we saw God do a miracle in our lives, you know what it did? It opened the floodgates in the community around us because people said, you know what? They had an impossible situation, but they called on the God of the impossible. And if the God of the impossible can come through in their impossible situation, then surely He can in my life. Some of you, God is giving you context right now for why it seems like He's distracted along the way. Friend, He's never distracted He's never off course. He's just allowing you to see some other things along the journey to give you the faith that you really need in order to see the breakthrough. We can either get frustrated or we can get filled with faith. 
Now I want to get full of faith. See, some of us, we're agitated right now. We're agitated by someone else's miracle. Agitated by someone else's miracle. I believe God wants to use the agitation to get you out of the place of comfort that you've been on or been in. See, there's a, there's a process in the promise. There's a process in the promise. There's a way through to the breakthrough. You know, oftentimes we pray, but we want like spiritual teleportation, <laughs> like spiritual time travel. Like I want to pray. I want to pop that in my prayer microwave and I want to hit instant cook and I want in 10 seconds for my ready-made miracle. But you got to go through the promise, the process to get to the promise. If I expect a result, then I have to trust the process. I'll give you a little example. If I go to the gym, I tell lots of stories about going to the gym, which is so funny because I, I don't go to the gym hardly at all, and I should. And if I can just get real vulnerable with you, it's not even like I can't get to the gym because the gym is in my basement. But you know part of the reason that I don't go to the gym is because I know when I go to the gym, I'm going to be in pain after I go to the gym. You know why I'm going to be in pain? Because I haven't been to the gym and I got out of shape. But if I, if I go to the gym and focus on my temporary pain, then the, the outcome will be a measure of my pain. You ever met that friend who's like, they show up to work the next day and you're like, how you doing? They're like, oh man, I'm so, I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, leg day, man, leg day, first time in, you know, like two years. Uh, uh, uh. Now that's true in the moment, but that's temporary pain. But isn't it amazing that for many of us, that temporary pain keeps us away from a permanent result. See, I, I just, I wish that I could wake up in the morning and be like, I want big arms. Boom. I don't want to go through the, the pain of building these arms because it gets repetitious. And it's painful and sometimes it's a bit laborious, but it's part of the process of building the strength. See, I, I can go to the gym and focus on the pain or I can go to the gym and realize that the pain is part of the gain. And if I want gain, no pain, no gain, right? I wish somebody with some real arms would get up here and show us all, no pain, no gain. But some of us were in the pain not realizing that on the other side of this is some spiritual gain. And we got distracted by the pain, but I believe pain is part of the process to get you to the promise. But we got our eyes fixed on the pain right now. But I want you to lift your eyes and get in line with what God's doing. Some of us are hoping for the promise without the process, but it doesn't happen like that. God is using this season. He's using the season that you're in right now. He's using the pain of the season that you're in. He's using the process of the season that you're in right now. You're praying for a breakthrough in your finances, but God is using this season to develop your stewardship. You're praying for a reaping, but God is using this season to expand your generosity. Thank you to this side of the room. You're praying for a healing, but God is using this season to develop some healthy habits in your life. Can I get a turn to your neighbor right now? Just kidding. You're praying for an outcome, but he's re redefining your outlook right now. Some of you are praying for a miracle so that you can praise him, but God's teaching you in the process how to praise him long before you get the miracle because he's worthy of your praise. He's always worthy of your praise. He's always worthy of your praise. See, the process is giving you framework of how to steward the miracle on the other side of this. Don't despise the process because God's with you on the journey. I want to get back to this, this woman for a moment in this story. This, this woman is desperate. She's been sick for 12 years. She spent everything that she has on doctors. Nobody's got any answers for her. And she's run out of options. 
Her bleeding for 12 years. I want you to understand this from a cultural point of view. Her bleeding would have meant that she was deemed unclean in society. And so for 12 years, she's been unclean, which means that not only is she unclean, anything or anyone that she touches is then also deemed unclean. So this woman is likely in a place where she's isolated, she's an outcast, she can't have physical contact with anybody, she is rejected by society. Now put this in the context of the fact, here's how desperate she is. She's so desperate that she would come into a crowded place where there's who knows how many people, but enough, the Bible says, that could have crushed Jesus. There's so many people there and this woman is doing everything that she can get to Jesus. Now, she's also essentially risking her own life because she's putting herself in a place where if everybody knew how unclean she was and the fact that if she touched them, they would also be unclean. And yet I love this about Jesus because when she reaches out and touches Jesus, Jesus doesn't say, hey, who just got a miracle? Jesus doesn't say, hey, hey, somebody here came with some faith. Um, you, you prayed and you got your miracle. Now, what does Jesus do? Jesus addresses the very area of shame and vulnerability in her life that's gonna expose her in front of everybody. He doesn't say, who just got a miracle? He says, who touched me? Now to the disciples, they don't realize that this is a big deal. They're like, Jesus, come, Jesus, like everybody's touching you. Everybody's up against you. But they don't realize that there's a woman who's so desperate that she's willing to risk everything, every bit of her reputation. She got nothing left. And she gets to that place of desperation and expectation that she says, I'm gonna push all this side aside just so I can touch Jesus. And Jesus doesn't say, who got the miracle? He addresses the issue. The point of pain says, who touched me? And she has an opportunity right there in that moment. Am I gonna be vulnerable before Jesus? Or am I gonna live by the expectation that everybody else has around me? And she puts all the expectation aside and says, Jesus, I got nothing else. I, I, wonder, I wonder how comfortable we've got in some areas of our lives that we, we need Jesus, but we can get by without Jesus. We need Jesus, but not at the cost that we are prepared to pay. The cost of our reputation. The cost of what others might think of us. The cost of the expectation of others overrules our expectation of Jesus. But man, I wanna live my life in a way where nothing else matters, where I don't care what the crowd thinks, where I don't care what people think. I don't care what people say me about me on social media. I don't care what people say about our church. I don't care if they think we're the crazy people. I just, I'm crazy enough to say none of that matters if that's what it takes to get to Jesus. See, some of you, you've been stuck in this place where you haven't got the breakthrough that you want because you're actually more concerned about others' expectation, about your own expectation than you are about putting expectation on Jesus. I'm wondering who's willing to get out of that place and say, I want to get to Jesus. See, your expectation will always require some agitation. The expectation in the spirit's going to require an agitation of the flesh. It's the agitation of expectation. Somebody turn to your neighbor and say, it's the agitation of expectation. I'm agitated. Good. 
but I don't like being agitated, but it's necessary. See, sometimes our agitation gets us annoyed and we don't realize the agitation is there to get us past the annoyance to get to the anointing. That is good, thank you. <laughs> See, when you're agitated, I was just talking with a friend before the service, sometimes we get agitated and we have a flesh response. But we don't realize that God is actually agitating things in the Spirit that require us to get beyond our flesh response to press into the Spirit realm because our flesh will get annoyed until our spirit man realizes that there is an anointing that we have access to, but you've got to push past the annoyance. See, we're agitated and frustrated, not realizing that our faith has become dilapidated. Right? Thank you that that kind of worked together there. You just... But agitation is part of getting you out of the place of comfort that you've been in. We don't like agitation, but we need agitation. Now let me make this real clear. Jesus, God did not give this woman sickness. God does not ever give us sickness. Why would Jesus come and die on the cross and take all of our infirmities and all of our sickness upon Himself so that we could have access to healing for them to heal? for him to then turn around and say, hey, you know what, I'm gonna make you sick. God does not make us sick. God will use our circumstances. God will use our sickness. And maybe this is agitating your flesh right now. Maybe you've grown up believing that God will make you sick to teach you a lesson. That's not how God teaches you a lesson. He already paid the price. And I'm sorry if somebody taught you a wrong theology that God gives you sickness. Now, God will allow circumstances along the way, absolutely. But He always gives us grace and He always gives us a measure of His Spirit and power for us to walk through that season while holding on to the hope that we have in Jesus. Now, God didn't give her sickness. But it required a stepping out and leaving everything behind to get access to the healing that Jesus had for her. What makes this woman different to everybody else in that crowd? Everybody else was around Jesus, but she had an expectation of Jesus. And in fact, Jesus wasn't an option. Jesus was the only option. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder why we see all across the earth in developing nations, signs, wonders, miracles, healings, and yet it's so uncommon here in our country. I wonder if it's because Jesus is an option, not the option. I wonder how many things that we've become comfortable with in our lives that are substitutes for what Jesus can really give us. But it requires an agitation. See, some of us have got, we've got stuck in some places. And so we just set up camp there. But God is wanting to agitate you out of that place today in Jesus' name. Now, listen, I'm not saying we're always going to get what we want from God when we want it, but we will always get Him. We will always get Him. And that's enough. Everything else that we can get from God is an overflow of who God is in our lives. My expectation is not on an outcome, but it's my outlook of Him. But you know, we were standing in church last Sunday morning. We were at Municipal Auditorium after an amazing time at conference. And uh, we're standing there in the second song and Cody's leading. Take you at your word. If you said it, I will. And it's, you know, like it's, it's a good song. It's a great song. It's kind of like that, you know, you can't, you can't really jump to it, but it's got like that, that worship bop. You know what I mean? It's kind of like if you haven't been to the gym, you can kind of like get in a round of, of leg day at the same time. Just bring, bring some weights with you. You can just kind of do some of these little things. right? Just, if you said it, I'll be, Thank you, Jesus. You're working on me right now. You're building me strength to strength, Lord. Thank you, God. You know, and we're singing this song and I'm singing lyrics, but I'm not really paying attention to what's happening through that song. And then in the middle of that song, I get word of an answer to prayer, something that Alex and I have been praying for for several years now. In the middle of that song, 
We get the answer that we've been praying for. And what do we do? We burst into tears and say, God, I can't believe you've done it. And he was like, I mean, awesome, but what are you singing right now? I take you at your, well, you know, maybe you can do something or maybe not. If you said it, well, then I'll think about it. And maybe or maybe not. And God's like, what were you thinking I was going to do? And we were like, well, well, God, here's the thing. On the way to our miracle, it felt like you stopped and gave everybody else their miracle. And I want to tell some of you here in this room today, God hasn't forgotten about His promise to you. He's just taking you on a journey because He's preparing you for the miracle. He's working on your behalf. Listen, there's, there's so much in this passage. I'll be done in a moment. Maybe the worship team can come and join me. But we have a, a woman who's bleeding for 12 years, who gets a miracle on the way to another story where there's a young girl who's 12 years of age who is dying. This is kind of like the, the ultimate Hollywood script here. You know, like you've got the main, the main plot and then there's kind of like this secondary plot that kind of comes along and it seems unrelated except for the fact that they're not unrelated at all. This is not a moment where Jesus was like, oh wow, guys, can you believe? Like she's had this condition for 12 years and this girl, she's, she's 12 years old and she's dying. I mean, what are the chances that there's like 12 and 12? Jesus is not surprised by this moment. He's not like, whoa. He's not like on his text thread with the disciples, like mind blown emoji. It's not what he's doing. He's trying to tell us something. Some scholars will tell us that the number 12 talks about the, the fulfillment of the kingdom of God. You've got 12 tribes, you've got 12 disciples. 12 is a significant number. Others will say it's, it's about the authority of God. And I wonder here in this moment where we have these two women both in their own way on the outskirts of society. Both in their own way overlooked by society of little significance to society. A woman who's been unclean for 12 years, an outcast, a young girl who, she's just a child. And yet Jesus sees both of these women as significant enough that He would leave this story for us for all eternity to show us that nobody's overlooked in the Kingdom of God. No matter, no matter how much of an outcast you feel like, no matter how unclean you feel, nobody's an outcast. No matter how much you feel like everybody has overlooked you, that you're not valuable enough, that you're not worthy enough, that there is no way possible that Jesus could actually see you in the crowd. I wanna tell you this today, friends. Jesus has never, He's never not seen you. He's never overlooked you. He's never stopped seeing you. We have a woman who's dying of a blood condition. And yet here Jesus, the one who's about to give His life, is about to, through His blood sacrifice, redeem all of mankind, walks into a situation and says, listen, your blood might be sick, but my blood is perfect and I'm about to heal you because no matter how unclean you are, you can never, your sin can never make me sinful. I wanna tell you, friend, there's no place that you can go, nothing that you've ever done that Jesus cannot redeem or restore you from. A young girl who's dying and Jesus says, listen, you might think that this is gonna end in death, but I'm about to give my life and I'm gonna pay the price so that death has no more sting. That death will have no more sting. The death is not the final say, the cross has the final word. He restores both of these women whose society or to say we're unimportant. This repetition, the 12 and the 12, the 12 and the 12, the 12 and the 12. Jesus is saying, pay attention, pay attention. 
See, I think sometimes we, we don't pay attention. We once paid attention. We once had an experience or an encounter that we paid attention to, but we're living in an old experience, an old understanding. I'll tell you an analogy and some of you in the room might switch off to this because I'm just going to delve back into my studio slash music world for a moment because it's Nashville. And uh, at least some of you in the room have used Pro Tools before. If you haven't, you'll catch up in a minute. But I started using Pro Tools in about 2005, so 18, 19 years ago. And when I started using Pro Tools, we were on Pro Tools 5.9.7. It's very important that you understand that because that, I believe, was the first version that worked with Mac OS X, which had just recently come out. Up until that moment, I had been a PC user. I had used Windows, and uh, I was doing a project, and my Windows machine wiped three of my four hard drives of a very important project. And I made a decision that I would never go back to Windows. So I transferred everything that I had left and put it onto my Mac. And you know, I took that Windows machine, I took that PC, and I threw it off the balcony so that it would be destroyed into a million pieces. I made a decision, I'm never going back to my old ways. You wanna talk about repentance? That's true repentance right there. Some of you got some, side note, some of you got some stuff going on in your life right now and you've been hanging on to it for too long and it's bringing destruction in your life. You gotta take that thing and throw it off the spiritual balcony so you don't ever go back to it. But that's beside the point. When I started using Pro Tools 5.9.7, it had some limitations to what you could do with Pro Tools 5.9.7. But you know, almost 20 years later, that software has come a long way. I'd love to say it doesn't crash at the worst time possible, but that's just not possible for us, right? Thank you for those who are laughing and just numb my pain right now, but... I've got many producer friends who have also been using Pro Tools for almost as long as I have. And it's amazing to me along the way because some of them are still using Pro Tools in 2023 like they were when they were using Pro Tools 5.9.7. Now they have access, they have access to a new experience, but they're living in an old understanding. And I'm like, but, but do you realize, like, you have access to all these new things, that, but you're, you're living in a past encounter. You're still like trying to load Melodyne as a plugin. You don't even realize that Melodyne can run, build into the Pro Tools user interface right now. Praise Jesus, thank you God. For those of you who are lost in my illustration here, let me, let me, let me, let me take it to you like this. We all have a friend I don't want you to point you to your neighbour right now, but we all have we all have at least one friend, or maybe it's a spouse, who's just a little bit technologically challenged. They're the, they're the person who just got a brand new iPhone 15, and they're still using that puppy like it's their Motorola Flip from the 90s, right? Like they text and they call, and that's it. And I mean that's cool. We'd probably keep some of us out of trouble, to be honest. But there's a whole different experience they have access to, but because they're familiar and comfortable with an old encounter, they're still living in the past. And I'm telling you this today because I believe for some of us, we once experienced something that God did, but we're still living in an old encounter. We have an expectation based on an old encounter. I'm not telling you today that God is new. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not changed. He's not upgraded. He doesn't doesn't need to be upgraded, but our experience and our encounter needs to be upgraded so our expectation of who He is can be true to who He says He is. And I believe for some of us here today, we've been, we've been stuck in this old place because we got offended. We got hurt. We had an experience with God's people that we thought was a reflection of who God is. So we built up some walls and some barriers and we said, I'm never gonna let myself into that place again. And so we've lowered our expectation. Friend, I don't wanna lower my theology 
to my experience. I want to bring my experience and my encounter up. Not my theology, his theology, his theology, his theology, his theology. It's amazing how many times we reason why we don't do something, even though it's contrary to the Word of God. Because it sounds, it sounds politically correct to the culture. But I don't want to live according to culture. I don't want to live according to my flesh. I don't want to live according to my experience. I want to live according to the Word of God. I'd love you to stand to your feet today. Some of you are in the season between what you're expecting and what you're currently experiencing. I believe God wants to lift your expectation. And this is the agitation for some of us here today because it's going to require getting out of a place that we've become comfortable in. We've become familiar with that. We know it's limited. We know it's not a full experience, but it's a comfortable experience. Jesus didn't die on a cross so that you could live a comfortable experience, but you can live a blessed experience. But to be blessed doesn't always mean to be comfortable. It was not comfortable for Mary as a teenage girl, a single parent. It was not comfortable, but it was God's experience for her. Some of us are going to walk through some things that don't feel comfortable, but God is using them to build our faith. 